Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening as we celebrate this incredible new collection of stories, creative writing um, from writers that are trying to reach the outside from the inside while we work through um, the issues of the prison industrial complex. There are some incredible writers that we have on deck who are cont uh, contributors, excuse me, <laughs> to this incredible book that we had the pleasure to work with the Penn Foundation. Um, and so I'm so incredibly thrilled to bring this um, this incredible tome um, that there's nothing like it in the landscape. And I think it's going to prove to be furtive for writers across all kinds of communities. Um, so a little bit about our guests, and then I will kick it off to um, our speakers. The first that I'll be introducing is Nana Kwame Adige Brenya, um, who is a New York Times bestselling author of Friday Black, originally from Spring Valley, New York. He graduated from SUNY Albany and went on to receive his MFA from Syracuse University. His work has appeared or is forthcoming from numerous publications, including the New York Times, Book Review, Esquire, Literary Hub, The Paris Review, Guernica, and Long Reads. He was selected by Colson Whitehead as one of the national Book Foundation's five under 35 honorees, is the winner of the Penn Gene Stein Book Award and a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle's John Leonard Award for Best First Book and the Aspen Words Literary Prize. He is on the steering committee of the Rockland Coalition to End the New Jim Crow, an advocacy group that works toward ending the use of the criminal justice system as a tool of racial oppression. Our next speaker and editor of the collection, Kate Meisner, is the director of prison and justice writing at Penn America. She has taught, consulted, and co-created extensively for over 15 years across a wide spectrum of communities with a focus on prisons, public schools, and college classrooms at the New School and the City College of New York. In 2017, Meissner re-envisioned the concept of book tour for her illustrated poetry collection, Let It Die Hungry, pairing public speaking engagements with opportunities to work with incarcerated writers across the United States. Last but certainly not least, Reginald Dwayne Betts is the founder of Freedom Reads, a first of its kind organization working to radically transform access to literature in prison. In 2018 of October, the New York Times Magazine published Betts' long essay, Getting Out. Several months later, the piece was awarded a National Magazine Award. The publication was another example of Betts entering into a new genre and bringing the same depth and richness of self-reflection and exploration of the central problem of this generation, incarceration and its effects of families and communities. Betts transformed himself from a 16-year-old kid sentenced to nine years in prison to a critically acclaimed writer and graduate of the Yale Law School. He has written three acclaimed collections of poetry, the recently published Felon, along with Bastards of the Reagan Era, and Shahid Reads His Own Palms. To hear more about the Penn Foundation and about this incredible project, I'm going to kick it off to Kate Meisner again, who is the editor um, and who was so incredible in bringing all of these talented voices together. So without further ado, I kick it off to you, Kate. Thanks, Eric. It's special to, get to have you introduced tonight. Uh, I am indeed the director of prison and justice writing at Penn America, uh, if you can't tell lots of visual aids. I'm really, 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 really honored and excited to be in conversation with, with Nana and Duane tonight around this book that I have to show off because I can't believe it's really here. And to give just a little taste, I, I assume if you're on this event, you know what the book is about somewhat, but you're going to learn a lot more tonight. Uh, there's over 50 contributors in this collection that looks at the writing life from professional capital, capital W writer, how to get published, how to do things through prison walls, which are often processes that are opaque, to the nuts and bolts of craft, to the uh, philosophy behind why we write as people. So that's just a little entryway. And I will let Nana ask the questions that are gonna bring some interesting conversation forward, I hope. And so first, I just want to say uh, thank you guys for including me in this conversation. I'm really excited to get to speak to both of you. Um, and uh, I've been a fan of y'all's work for a long time, and it's really cool to just to see this book come into the world for real. And that's sort of like my first question is, um, for you, Kate, at least, like, what is it like to have this book really exist in the world after all this work that's been put into it? And then um, after that, um, Dwayne, I was wondering if you, I've heard you say before that writing is a way to sort of um, build your own existence into the world. And I, I wonder if you could expand on that idea, like what it really means to exist 
um, through writing. And then for Kate's, uh, maybe you can start off by just saying, how do you feel right now with this book finally existing physically in the world? Oh, thank you for the question. Uh, I mean, I, it feels surreal to me. And I think what makes it real are the reactions and the moments that are happening on the heels of the publication. So watching literary agents, top tier literary agents reach out to formerly incarcerated writers in the book or maybe just coming into their career. Uh, yeah. with serious interest, you know. Uh, or a letter from a contributor in prison kind of nailing, you know, you really hit the head. I was going to give this to our prison newspaper office, but not going to happen. Can you send them one? And I think these moments of of, of watching what's going to happen thanks to the work in the book is 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 the greatest testament to it. It's very exciting. Yeah. And how is it? How is it here? <laughs> All right. And, and, again, and again, so I feel like this book is kind of in service to like those who want to assert their existence through writing. And and so, Dwayne, like on your side, um, what do you think about that idea of like forging your own existence using the word? Yeah, I think it's uh, I was looking at the book. I have it, too. And. Um, and, you know, I was interesting is is it's like. They didn't have to put my name on the cover, but it's kind of cool that they did. And um, my camera's kind of off. But, you know, what's interesting is um, I think about this as a as a craft book. And and I think one version of the book is that it's only in service to writers who are in prison. Um, but I think actually it's in service to anybody that's a writer. And it's just thinking about writing in a in a context of um in a context that allows the reader to participate, not just in the sort of developing some skills, um, but also to allow the reader to participate in a conversation about freedom, um, about justice, about about liberation. Uh, and, and I don't know, you know, I, um, even the idea of, you know, the sentences that create us, I think what I think about it is, um, writing is a process of becoming and and a lot of us uh because we come to writing um through school it becomes professionalized like very very quickly right and and we forget that the whole process of writing of developing your talents as a writer is about what it means to become somebody and for people that's in prison the, the writing the act of writing is a direct um relationship um you know, between who you are and who you want to be. And 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 I think, um, you know, holding a book reminds me of that because something like this didn't exist uh, when I was in prison, uh, obviously. Although it's companion books existed. I, I bet I got some, my fucking office is a mess. Yep. Like one of the first craft books I read, wildly enough, um, you know, was the practice of poetry. Right. And I read this um, when I was in prison and and it and and I see some of the same stuff in terms of Luis Rodriguez talking about guzzles. You see the same kind of conversation. So, you know, having said everything I did say, this is still exist in a continuum of, of a whole lot of craft books that help create me as the writer I am um, today. And I'm glad you said that. Uh, and I also have a copy of the book just so I can let people see and we try to reinforce that we want y'all to pick this up. Um, I uh, I think that this book, along with many other books, it, to me at least, it feels like it's part of a movement. Um, and I think that, Dwayne, you're obviously, in, or at least in my opinion, someone really is pushing this movement uh, with Freedom Reads and all the work, kind of your whole existence in so many ways. Uh, can you talk about what Freedom Reads is? And and then I guess, um, Kate, after that, I have a question for you too. Um, yes, yeah, interesting. I mean, you know, <laughs> It's so funny, man. I, I, so Freedom Reads is uh, an organization I founded with a really generous grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, um, led by Elizabeth Alexander. The idea germinates in prison. You know, I was locked up. I was doing in a library loan. Uh, but it was hard to have access to certain books, you know, and it was just because uh, sometimes I was at prisons that didn't have libraries at all. And, and then sometimes I was at prisons that had libraries, but I, it was always um you know, you had to work. I was working a nine to five. I was in prison, but I was working a nine to five for 25, 35, 45 cents an hour. And that meant that I didn't have a lot of time to go to the library and browse. And so what we do is we build um, libraries in prisons and they're um, 
you know, the, 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 the shelving system was designed by us, but, but with collaboration from mass design. So we got some world renowned, brilliant architects to design these systems. That's wow. like curved. It's made out of hardwood. It's, you know, bamboo, uh, plywood, but it's um, maple. So you got bamboo, you got maple, you got uh, walnut, and it's beautiful. And the way the, the structures are set up is that you can access the books from both sides of the structures. And the structures can hold anywhere from each module holds between 120 and 150 books. And they're modular. So depending on the space, you can stack modules up and you can create a space for people um, to, to connect, to bond, to um, conversate. Uh, over books and it's a word because I said it. So you know, if you like conversate isn't a word, <laughs> but um, but it's pretty dope. But you know, in other but the other thing I think about in terms of like what Freedom Libraries and what Freedom Reads tries to do and building these Freedom Libraries is to create a conversation between the inside and the outside. Yeah. So you don't have a lot of writers that go into prisons, frankly. You know, you got for all of this talk about mass incarceration and reform in the justice system, I'm still consistently in prisons where they've never met writers before. I'm still consistently in prisons where uh, where there's is no conduit um, between them and the outside world, world that's helping them get news of the world out. So, so Freedom Reads is trying to encourage that, it's trying to create a system, because writers want to go in. It's not that we don't care, it's just that you got to have a mechanism, you know, you got to find a way to make it easier for folks. And so uh, yeah. we do some of those connections to bring people in their work inside prisons. I love that. And I'm definitely going to personally talk to you about that later on. Um, but Case, how much do you understand sort of this book as part of a, a tradition or a movement or uh, sort of another in a line of books that have existed for this purpose? Sure. Well, I can answer it in so many ways. And I, I, I also want to just say, I have so many tangential things I want to bring up, Dwayne, when I hear you talk. And uh, I, had, all up. <laughs> I had an opportunity to see you present on Freedom Reads and, and see those uh, beautiful bookshelves. And I think there's a conversation to be had about aesthetics. And, and uh, I like that you mentioned beauty and what it means to be, bring beauty to, to a place like that. And we had an interesting road coming up with this book cover and thinking about aesthetics and beauty and professionalism and, but also not professionalism. There's, there, it, it, it's a whole, we could go loop back there. But to answer your question, Nana, I think, you know, um, I also wanted to say, you know, connecting writers and community inside outside is a major goal of this book as well. So a lot of resonance with Freedom Reads. When I saw Freedom Reads, I said, wait, what? <laughs> we have a project that's going to go really nicely hand in hand. And actually, shout out to the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation Indeed, because they funded um, 75,000 copies of this book to reach folks in prison for free. So we're working on disseminating those as well, which is incredible. Um, but in terms of being a tradition, I mean, certainly there, there's recommended reading in the back of the book that has craft books. In fact, it might even have that poetry book you held up, Dwayne. And certainly I thought, you know, I have an MFA, you know, craft has been important to me on a totally different level. But I think that um, this book has a very particular legacy, which is that there was the handbook for writers in prison that PEN America put out for many, many years. And it was the slim volume about this thick that was instructions on the basics of each creative writing genre. And for many years, it grew from a photocopied pamphlet to a book self-published by Penn and a, a small dedicated committee of volunteers would get this book into hands in prison for free. And I knew about it from when I taught in prison. Oh. <laughs> there you are. Okay, I'm, I'm even on ethernet and it's still being funky. I assume um, I assume mine was the one that went out, perfect. It's just Mercury retrograde, I'm told. Um, so essentially, there was there is actual an actual book that it was this book's predecessor. But when I came into the program and took it over, and it was suggested to me by both the former director and my current supervisor, shout out to Drew Meneker, um, I, I decided to reimagine it completely because that was the question I had was really what differentiates this from other craft books that exist. And the idea was that the writers were going to be responsive to the needs of writers in prison. So, of course, there's a lot of craft in here that can reach anybody, but there's layers that are specific to seeing yourself in the work, which I felt was uh, important from all the context that I was learning from all the many letters we get at Penn. 
Incredible. Uh, and you mentioned it. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the cover? Because I know there's a little bit of a story of how you sort of decided this is what it would be. Sure. So, you know, I hope Haymarket is going to look at me with loving eyes for saying that they 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 brought beautiful covers to my attention. Um, but unfortunately, and this happens all the time with work around prison, this is a book about, like Dwayne said, this is a book really about personal liberation and liberation through writing at its core, I think, at its essence. And what I was seeing were covers that were, looked like prison. So I, I said, I, you can't send a book about liberation into prison that I'm not sending prison into prison. And I really thought about uh, what um, what symbolized work getting into the world, like Dwayne said, connecting back in. And obviously our whole programming is through the mail because there's a very limited pseudo internet in prisons. There's JPay, you know, these kind of systems where you pay to play, get an email, one directional, it's censored. And we have stacks and stacks and stacks and stacks and stacks and stacks and stacks of mail that has to be handled and gone through. And we have an ethic of trying to respond to every single missive we get. Many of those letters inform the content of this book because we just looked at what are people asking for that we have no answer to, the kind of difficult and ephemeral questions about being a writer. That's hard for us on the outside to understand, never mind not having a Google search engine at your disposal. So the mail and the butterfly symbol, of course, is one we see all the time in social justice and, and in prison work historically. So there's a callback to history in that, and then but they're made out of mail. So the idea is it's coming out of you know, coming out of prison and into the world. And our, our designer at Penn, Melissa Jasko, did a great job taking that concept and making it real. My ideas were too literal. Butterflies coming out of envelope look terrible. Um, and it was interesting because Piper Kerman said to me, who's in this book, uh, creator of Orange is the New Black, writer of Orange is the New Black, the memoir, uh, she said it has a feminine look. And usually we're used to seeing uh, things about prison look so masculine. So that was another nice reflection that we got on the cover. But the pedagogy, I think, is what's most important. How do we actually represent things coming out of prison? Do they always have to look like prison? Yeah. And um, Dwayne already mentioned how his name his name was on the cover. And I, I mean, I'm sure, uh, and for me, at least, the answer is sort of obvious. But can you speak about, like, that choice to have Dwayne oh, doing yeah. the foreword? And then, Dwayne, you could talk about sort of what you thought once you were asked to do that and how um, you should have decided to craft that. Well, my answer is easy. I'm a huge fan of Dwayne. I was a fan of Dwayne before I met him. I have Shahid, the first book. Um, Dwayne's work for me was in the canon of the Etheridge Night, you know, that I was reading. And and Dwayne, you had told the story, you tell the story about the Black Poets anthology being slid under your cell door. I was 15 and somebody gifted me that book and it changed my life in upstate New York. To- totally different scenario. So um, for me, Duane is so many people in prison's role model. I hear about it all the time. I'm privy to that idea all the time. And so it only made sense to me that Duane not only legitimized this collection for the people in it, legitimized it for what we're talking about as someone who not only lived the experience, but like you said, walks the walk every day. Uh, And I I wanted his energy to bless the book and all the contributors and all the readers who are going to see it and how important it was going to be for them that Duane really framed this content. Yeah, I remember the first time I actually saw Dwayne, I was teaching in um, Syracuse and I was like the student, maybe like the new teacher, but or a student teacher who had to like pick him up from the airport. And I had I was really excited to because in the in that classroom when we were teaching that book, it was just so clear how much he um, was um, had affected the students. This was um, Bashes of the Regan era. And yeah. we had sort of done a ba- background on his story and sort of seeing who he was. And I, I saw, like, in real time, the students. Did you guys hear me talking? No. No, we saw you. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're good. But I, I was actually telling, I was talking about how the first time, um, and I'm about to ask you about writing this forward, about the first time I had met you, I had just come off teaching your book. And I saw in real time your person sort of changing these students' minds about what it meant to um be an artist and what it meant to be uh, formerly incarcerated, what it meant to be a lawyer and all these different sort of, I don't know, like identities that you contain. And um, so I, I was wondering, like when you went into write this forward, which I think really sets this book up nicely, what were you thinking about? And like, how did you decide to sort of attack that project? I'm a bit um, discombobulated. I just got a call from prison. And the I, thing is like- I knew you did. I said he wouldn't have taken that unless he was from prison. And the thing is, my man, I've, you know, represented him on parole. And this is the story I didn't tell. So when when Freedom Reads first got announced, yeah, um, somebody responded, and I, you know, I'm bragging and shit. I'm not really bragging, but I'm I'm putting it on Twitter like I'm doing this thing. I think it's dope. 
And somebody responded, um, I thought we were trying to get people out of prison. I was, so mad. Like, I was like, so glad. Bro, you deserve to brag. Come on, you deserve to brag for that project, for the and, whole thing. And, I, and also, but I was going to ask response. about an exact question that people ask, and I'm very excited you brought it up. Go for it. But my response was, you know, I got three people out of prison in the last 12 months. Who you got out of prison? Facts. And it, and it just so happened, though, that I had been winning, and I've been representing people on parole, and we had been winning. And we had been winning because it was it was people on the ground in Virginia that worked really hard to get the the, the um, legislator turned over to the Democrats for the first time in a quarter century. And they had passed um, and then, you know, they had a Democratic governor and he had put together a relatively progressive parole board. When you talk about going from three percent grant rate to 12 yep. percent. And then the legislator brought back parole for people who got locked up as juveniles. And so I've been representing my homies friends of mine. Um, but the point is, and this is where I think about writers, um, the parole board gets blasted in Virginia because they released a cat that did 40 years um, for killing a police officer. He did 40 years. Everybody called this dude brother. Even the COs called him brother. You know, they said that he had stopped riots, that he had saved people's lives. And I get it. You know, he murdered somebody and he murdered a police officer, but he was eligible for parole. And it was supposed to be this idea that there's something that you could do that you deserve mercy. And the truth is, you know, we as writers are typically profoundly absent when it comes to having a conversation about what freedom means, right? Like when when this parole board controversy happened, it was a a, a, a sort of like right wing Republican columnist who wrote like six hit pieces on the parole board. So they turned this into an issue, and it was like one of the sort of um, major issues in the recent gubernatorial election in Virginia, which was won by a Republican. And so now they overturn. It's still amazingly hard to get a pardon. Like the shit is just not a free lunch. Nobody gets one. And now cats who get them is getting overturned. And my homeboy is calling me like, you know, I don't know if, if my review, when I went up for the parole board, if was it shady? Um, was my Was my application taken seriously? Who actually read it? And so it becomes a, a vital question, both in terms of what do we mean when we want to get people free, but in terms of being a writer, what does it mean to, to tell the stories that need to be told that propel and push a case for mercy and a case for freedom? And I think what's really mostly um, compelling about this book is that it equips people to, to, to do that for themselves. Now, the truth is I've failed to get more people out of prison than I've actually gotten out of prison. And so my response to this young woman was was like, you know, it was kind of glib, but mostly because I couldn't, I, my only other response was like, who the fuck do you think you talking to? And and I get phone calls from people who, who share my blood who are in prison, who I am completely fucking helpless to get out. But I am not helpless to get them books. And, and so you do what you can when you can. And I do think that we need to find a way to build a larger narrative about what does it mean to try to sustain um, our life and our commitments to each other given how 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 fucking like impossible the world is most times you know yeah um, i forgot what your question was because i actually cause, think oh. this is a great answer it bro yeah <laughs> there's also a great inroad Duane, in what you're saying because there's an because this book i think when people see the cover and, and read the description are thinking you know craft and certainly it's craft but there's also an essay in here by alejo rodriguez i was gonna of, mention it one of my mentors you want to talk about it nana well, I was going to say for someone who isn't as embedded in the work as y'all two are, um, that particular essay, um, well, to sort of answer Dwayne's point, like Dwayne is doing the work in his person as a lawyer, which is already absurd because he's a creative and a poet. You know, most like so many of us that writers, like we barely do that. And that's all we do. Let alone that he's, you know, this um, lawyer. He's also a lawyer going to um, law school did have, and now is actually actively working directly to get people free. Also, though, that particular story that you're mentioning now, um, that essay, speaks about how creativity can directly serve the process of getting free. And I had yeah. never, I had, I had never really, until reading that particular essay, I've thought about like this subject extensively, especially because of the stuff I'm working on now. But I had never thought about like what it feels like to be in front of a parole board, or never read a firsthand account about that. And so it was really illuminating for me. And I love that that sort of inclusion in the book because of how it 
it's it speaks to how um, those who might read it can say, listen, this this creativity, this this thinking in this way is going to serve you because it did for me. Um, but you can continue on that path. Yeah. So, so Alejo writes this essay that you're speaking to about um, he does 33 years in prison. He goes above the pro to, to the parole board 13 times, I believe, and he finally makes it after 13 times. And it, he really writes about tapping into learning about poetry and and figuring out how to write like himself. And that's essentially how he he says it resonated with the parole board finally. I mean, do we actually know step by step by step? No. Uh, but he's home now and he's working with Zealous, uh, an amazing organization working with public defenders and artists and bringing it all together. And he gives tips on on really how to use art as advocacy from that firsthand experience. So what I wanted to kind of, you know, kick back to Dwayne is like, Dwayne, you're representing a writer in this book. We've talked about how to get him home and how to support him. I think that beyond, you know, certainly craft. And yes, we want people to read this book, buy this book, enjoy this book from a craft perspective. But from a literal how this book could help people come home is uh, I, I'm curious if you could expound a little bit on, on on writing's role. And I know it's not a linear line, but I'm thinking about things like going above the board, you know, pro prep project works with people to prep their statements. Like what are, what are also some, uh, you know, if somebody doesn't want to professionalize themselves as a writer, what does a book like this fill in the gaps for or potentially do? Well, I mean, I, I also think that it's important to just sort of remember, and this is one of the things that the public doesn't have enough of a conversation about is, you know, I learned how to think um, by becoming a writer. I learned how to think. And every time I write something, it's the, the act of revision is truly the process of rethinking. And so I think one of the things that the, the book does is equip people to do that. You know, some people will say, um, yeah, I've been locked up. I mean, I never talked about my crime to anybody. And so if the, if the goal was rehabilitation, um, if the goal was grappling with what it means to put a gun in somebody's face. Uh, my experience of prison didn't give me the tools to do that. But my experience in becoming a writer gave me those tools. And so um so on on a on a on for those people who who aren't writers or who are writers but but they think of themselves as writers and, and they're not chasing James Baldwin, but they might just be chasing a, a lovely letter. You know, some of the some of the best letters I've read were from like soldiers from Maine who were writing letters to their family um, from the front lines of the Civil War trying to explain why they chose to participate in that fight. So, you know, when you're inside, every time you write your loved one, um, every time you write a letter to the editor, you are you are doing something that uh, you're creating, if we're lucky, something that will be a part of the archive that explains um, how we've treated each other, you know, with, with prison. And then in terms of just actually like we as writers, I do think it's something to be, I do think it's something to be said for um, for how we could engage with the world through our work. And, and, and so I'm talking about like, you got to pitch five op-eds before one gets accepted. You got to write a dozen bad op-eds. And some of the things that we produce, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I know as like writing fiction, I mean, we chasing history. You know, writing nonfiction, we're chasing history. Um, but sometimes we got to write this stuff that's just chasing awareness. And so it becomes the op-ed that you know is not going to, it's going to start a conversation that you hope lasts um, for three or four days. And, and, and it pisses you off because you spent hours and hours and hours hoping that something will spark a three or four, um, you know, hour conversation total in its lifespan. And that's why we aren't willing to do it. But I think we got to be more willing, w willing to do it. And we got to find ways like those organizations that, you know, none of them know us. They don't use our work. And that's on them. But it's also on us. The NAACP, I don't won that fucking award twice. Ask me if I've had a conversation with the people at the NAACP about how my art might right. advance the causes that we both care about. And, I, and I'm not going to run down a list of organizations, but I'm a fucking legit genius now. And ain't none of them people ever holler at me like, yo, can we collaborate to use narrative to change something? It was just like, yo, dude, you know, prove to us you nice and we still going to ignore you because the world in which you nice in does not fucking reflect 
the, the change and the systemic change we want to happen. And yep. so I think this book also says, and, and Haymarket publishing this book, and this book being edited by you, and, and the work that Penn has already done around prison and writing, it says, wait a minute, this work around prison and writing should have a bigger footprint in some of these other spaces. Yep. I think you're saying something really real. And I and I think about it a lot as a writer because there's the we put so much effort into this craft, right? And then there's a there's a, there's another piece though, uh, which is like your real lived life. How do you use that to serve a purpose? And maybe the purposes that align with what you're sort of um maybe your work is engaging. And um that can be I think for at least with the institutions that exist currently in publishing or, or quote unquote, li many literary spaces, not all of them, but that isn't so much the point, you know? Um, a lot of it is like sort of like glory, glory for glory's sake. Um, win an award to win an award, uh, to be in the cool table kind of. And I think that um, Penn is obviously a, a group that's sort of different. It sort of exists, it seems like it seems to like really like have like an impact in terms of like lived experience of life. And um, it's a challenge in, in a lot of ways. And, I, and then to the other point you were saying, I was thinking about how reading is, 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 so much of a, is so much of my life or it's created so much of my life. It's created the way I, I view, the way I look at every single thing and how Freedom Reads is granting that power of reading and reading diversely and reading in a sort of illuminating way to so many people. It basically just makes me think of how ignorant it is that whoever might tell you, I thought we were trying to get people free when you tell them I'm I'm creating, I'm giving them access to books. Cause it just But 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 Shorty, not Shorty, because that's a disrespectful way to refer to this um this young woman. She yeah, you know, she might have been like she might have just got the same phone call I got. And 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 that I mean, and that's the other part of it. And so Word. I, I wish I would have admitted my failure to her. Instead of my successes, you know, I wish that I would have approached it in a different way. And, and I should just note that we build libraries for for the men and women in prison and, and the young people at juvenile detention centers, but also for the staff and the COs that work there as well. Um, because in some real way, you know, like my life is mm. is frequently closer to the lives of the people who work in prison than the people who share um, the like the sort of like I got like an AA, a BA, a JD. I got a lot of college degrees, the MFA. Shit is embarrassing, actually. But my, my, but the COs and the staff, their life is is really closer than mine than the people who share the credentials that I've been able to build, you know, post incarceration. And and I think it's important for me to be like, if I don't know, I think it's think it's important to recognize that my homeboy brother has been a CO for 20 years and he's been in prison for 20 years. And the narrative that makes that possible has to be can be disrupted by literature on both ends, not just All on right. one. End. I, I think I want to bring the two things brought up back to the book because that's my role. <laughs> uh, one is, I think, you know, something that really humbled me in getting my copy from Haymarket and looking back over these essays after, you know, ha not looking at them for some time was um, Thomas Bartlett Whitaker's essay. Uh, it opens a section of the book that talks about um, how to craft a writer's life in prison, and it's called The Price of Remaining Human. And Thomas has a really difficult story uh, in which it, part of the story is that he was called, you know, got a call from the governor to, to uh, call off his execution moments before uh, being, before he was to be executed by the state. And he sort of opens the chapter bursting bubbles. You know, the person next door in the cell next door is saying that you're gonna sell a million copies uh, and get rich off your urban novel. In short, it's a lie. And what he says is he watched 161 men get executed on death row. He knew all of them. He remembered all their stories. And you have to write because you're haunted. And, and a humbling piece of this book is actually like, you know, almost I, I, the conversation about the awards and being in the public eye and what you can get from writing and how institutions use you. It's. I think it's all made very small by some of these. It's all interlinked, but it's made very small by some of the realities people are living, and brings us back to kind of the core questions about why we do what we do as creators. And um, and I also wanted to uh, to pull into focus something else that now is escaping me. Um, I oh. think I think the I think the idea the, the the question that I wanted to raise about or that Dwayne raised about this idea of when people say I thought we we're trying to close prisons why are you bringing resources to prison and I think that's a really oh, oh I wanted to talk about 
uh, the voices in this book and what surprised me. There's a sense of, I think, super antagonism around actors of the system, and rightfully so, but I, Dwayne, have really understand what you're saying, having visited over 23 prisons in the United States and seeing who the CEOs are and seeing that people's cousins are working there and seeing that people are not having access to the same things. They're in prison in a way to 16 hour shifts. I was teaching at Rikers many, many years ago, young women, and there was a, a woman who worked there and she would pull me aside all the time and be like, I am trying to get transferred to the teen unit, as depressing as that this whole scenario sounds, because it's the only place I can have any semblance of a heart here. They really beat it out of you. And across this book, uh, what surprised me slash not surprised me is the idea that people reiterate over and over and over and over and over and over and over, which is find your institutional allies. And I think reading a, um, right. uh, an interview with Wilbert Rideau, who is a legend and uh, was the first black editor of the Angle Light News. He was a correspondent from prison for fresh air. He's just a really compelling figure who's now uh, works to get people, basically works with difficult death row cases. He goes and talks to people on death row and says, hey, you want to live and here's why, essentially, um, through his own experience. And and he's the one writing that after all all of what he was able to accomplish and and uh, and also through a lot of rogue and revolutionary means, like when he was not able to edit the newspaper because of segregation, mandatory segregation. He started a, a news magazine with the Lifers Association that was all black run. So um, I think that really has a part of the conversation and it's also a conversation that this book I think straddles as well uh, is this sort of polarizing idea of like, you must be on this side or this side, like there's not people in between all of those spaces. I think that's an important point that's easy to overlook. So I appreciate that. Um, and so can kind of continue like push, putting some focus on the book. Can you speak to uh, some of the sort of responses or reactions like, from participants or people who are included in this book that you've gone this far and how sort of how they sort of feel being in in, um, in a collection like this? Uh, sure. I mean, the, the ones from prison are coming slowly because the mail is slow, A. Yeah. <laughs> and B, did the book get to them through the prison mail? And C... I'm waiting for letters or phone calls. And I, you know, like Dwayne, I often will go in the middle of a meeting and go, excuse me, I got to take this because I might not hear from this person for another week and I can't call him back, which was a lot of how the book was made, was editing with people over the phone. Yeah. And, um, I, you know, I, one note that really stuck out to me was, uh, was said, Kate, this is like writing for the big book of AA, which I took as a major compliment. I was like, all right. Uh, you know, there's a there was a history and a legend to this book that came before. So I think the idea of being a part of this reiteration that kind of meets the moment of what we're talking about ethically, politically, was thrilling. You know, and and the idea that uh, that a book that they benefit benefited from was being recreated and now imagining their words being passed hand to hand and becoming part of the this kind of canon of this book, so to speak. Yeah, I, I think for the most part, I actually think for the entire part, people were. Uh, were excited and ready. And I got to say, for having a book with 50 contributors and the amount of editing we had to do because we had to cut 200 pages from the book, it was originally like a textbook. People people were so gracious and supportive of the overall that cut? Budget. No, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody got cut, Dwayne. Just some pieces got cut. But but it was good yeah. because it was everybody was writing their piece in a vacuum. So there was a lot of repeat content. you know. So carving it was its own process. Um, but I think, uh, you know, kind of amazingly, people by and large put their ego aside. And that really, I think, spoke to the heart of the, yeah. of the project as well. I mean, I, my fold was 50 pages. And um, and then <laughs> it made me cut it down. <laughs> you, you were generous with everybody. In two yeah. words in yours, let's be honest, you gave me an incredibly clean copy. And for that, <laughs> I thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you distilled it to a really acute and important point, I thought, about the democratic nature of language or the potentially democratic nature of language when it's not so intensely stifled, which in some ways, Kate, you kind of alluded to this a couple of times, and I'm interested if you want to expand on it, sort of the challenges of creating something like this, whether they be bureaucratic or logistic in terms of the mail or um, sort of maybe ethical. I know you've uh, mentioned that like there's potential changes for blowback for some of the participants who are currently inside. So I was wondering about sort of the challenges and how you navigated um, in this sort of editorial process. 
Sure. I mean, I think probably the biggest challenge I was faced with first was there were so many people that asked to po be possible contributors that that was an amazing problem to be faced with. There are so many writers that I would love to tell you about more on this book. But the big, the big task for me was looking at what I was a, a really afforded at Penn, which was access to a community that had been formed for 40 years before I had anything to do with it. Amazing. Get to know people, you know, f make those relationships, support people. Uh, I was a year on the job before I even considered touching this project. It was in my mind though, because I really wanted to understand who I was working with, who was writing to us, the landscape. I wanted to connect with people I'd met in my life previous to Penn, but doing prison and, and, and writing work. And then, and then it was really looking at, you know, what are the individual stories that are going to start to paint this tapestry? You know, there's so many people who could tell their stories, but which are the particular stories that will sit together to knit this ambitious vision? And, uh, you know, one of the major challenges, of course, is certainly communication and editing. So there's a story in my intro of, you know, finally getting my friend Spoon on the phone and he nailed the essay and we got it. But a lot of logistical back and forth, certainly things getting lost in the mail during COVID um, when, when the mail shot up intensively because all of our work at Penn is through the mail and all the programs in prison shut down. Um, you know, uh, all the normal things when you edit a book, like chasing people in deadlines. Um, but I think that the challenges to come are going to be really interesting. And we're sitting in this really interesting moment where somebody like Duane has really blazed a path starting these libraries and prisons and has been working with prison administration. And for so long, we've chosen not to because our power is in individual people. And if we start to hang out with the wardens too much, then censorship is upon us and Penn is a free expression organization after all. But we will have to do some of that work coming up. So my colleagues at Penn did this massive book banning report. My colleagues in the free expression department, James Tager, on uh, looking at books that are banned in prison. So it's a big question mark for us, knowing that prisons love to ban things for safety reasons. I, I think that I think that that book. I mean, look, you know, I think one of the one of the real fundamental challenges I have is is very few people are filing lawsuits on like literal books that get banned. And what happens is it's much easier. Somebody just quoted me in a piece, and I was like, "Yo, kind of keep my name out your mouth," you know, like. Because the thing is, what happens is, is I send a book in, you know, and um, I sent Friday Black in. I was trying to find it on my bookshelf because I knew I had it. <laughs> Where's my copy? So I send this joint in, right? And um. I send this in and it gets banned and it gets banned because somebody flips to one page and they just read something and they don't understand what it is that they're reading. Right. And what happens is, is, is so, so Samantha reports that this book got banned to Penn. She doesn't write a complaint about it being banned or she writes one and the prison says, well, the person who sent it to you has to complain about it because we just sent the book back to them. Mm. And there's no follow up. And, and people are so mad about prison censorship and criticizing the wardens and the COs who are just like regular folks making bad decisions. And they aren't having a robust set of conversations with them about this whole protocol, this whole process and what's happening. And then they talk about prison officials as if like they're the judges or the prosecutors or the citizens that don't do shit about the laws that aren't changing. Now, I think that there's a lot of things that we should hold people in prison, um, people who run prisons accountable for, particularly around safety, particularly around programming, um, particularly around like access to opportunities and access to literature. But I've, I have very rarely see things that I find credible um, when talking about prison censorship. I see people who, who want to be in print for saying that, but I'm like, where's your follow through? Well, uh where's the lawsuit that you look at and map out the responses to it. And I just think it's like when people talk shit about like, we should have more, we should we should release X percentage of the people in prison. And then you say, okay, well, what efforts are you a part of that's developing some of the pathways to yeah. freedom? Well, I, I, I'm not, I, I, I agree with you completely, Duane, but I, I, let me reframe it a little bit. So, you know, I, I think that, um, I agree with you. Yeah, yes, there needs to be some follow-up note taken. Let's see what we can do. But 
uh, I think with this particular book, it 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 might be met with, oh, great, another free thing we can give to our inmates, you know. But I think it also could be met, depending on the prison official, and certainly in programming deserts when we're away from the cities and we're getting into, you know, Gatesville, Texas, with six prisons on one strip of land, uh, that this is really a book about how to organize, and the Building Writing Collective lays that map out. It's really a book about self-determination. It's a book about how you get paid when you're in prison. You know, that all of these are embedded within the dialogue of the book, and these are all things that uh, are, are possible reasoning. So we'll see what happens, and we will follow up. But I think even more so, Nana, what you were pointing to is is the idea of, of what writers in prison, what risks some of them put themselves in, in in order to be in a book like this. So all the folks I worked with are people who've taken major risks. They've done things, they've published, they've done interesting things behind the walls, they've made a full life. So they are well aware of what they might be in for. And somebody like a Thomas, who I mentioned earlier, who's already been in segregation since getting off death row for years because the prison system in Texas hates him and all he represents, uh, you know, is this book going to put him in further danger of, of continued segregation or worse? Very possibly. And so I am waiting with some measure of, of bated breath to see if we get anything like this that comes. And it might be down the line over time and it and might not be at all. But uh, I think that when I thought about creating this book too, certainly with the writers inside, I knew I was working with comrades more than I was just working with, you know, some writers behind the walls. Like these were folks who were really putting their life on the line to tell some truth, you know? Right. Right. Um, and I, I want to call to the audience just to let they know if they have a question, tap that into the chat and we'll try to see if we get to some of them. Um, but um, to to Dwayne's point, I think there's 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 a really I'm really glad you're saying this because there's a I feel that there's sort of this sense of. The discontentment and there's, a, there's like a great amount of discontentment, and there's a lot of energy there, but there's sort of a a cynicism about the current systems in place generally, which it's it's almost a convenient cynicism because it leads to my answer is to tweet about something and that's it, as opposed to, um, you know, taking uh, sort of the, an actual like legal channel or pursuing the help of an organization potentially like Penn that might be able to sort of guide you in direction of really taking sort of um, action legal or otherwise that might directly change the issue that you like that that's generating all this energy and i mean and i, I feel like you're you're obviously very embedded in in actually doing this work and you're sort of uh, that's sort of like sort of what you've done in so many different avenues can you speak to like how you sort of get people to to sort of make that switch where it's like okay i have this feeling and i care about it deeply potentially or at least on some surface level, or at least on some, in some way, I mean, I'm, I'm, do, I'm caring enough to say something about it. Can you talk about like sort of the steps people can take after something has been said to engage, maybe particularly to, whether it's be censorship, which is having a moment in and out of prison, actually, in terms of books being banned, and but also just advocacy around uh, advocating for the incarcerated. Uh, well, you know, I'm a contrarian by nature, and um, and I just. I mean, for real, the, the, the report came out in 2019. It, it's like, I just read it again. Shit was like, you know, I'm not going to be overly critical um, because I'm talking to Kate's, but, but it was kind of bullshit to me. I, I, I Literally, I was just like, the, I, I would have much rather saw, like, I, I just literally just feel like it is just so much easier to, it is easier for me to talk shit about the report than well, it is than it is to like do actually something. I mean, when I was in prison and, and I couldn't buy books on my own, wasn't nobody suing the system, wasn't nobody organizing to be like, how do we change this particular policy or practice? I mean, it just wasn't happening. And I and I resent it. I resent the, the fucking cottage market that's around just always talking shit about the system and solving nothing. Most of the lawsuits are filed by legal news. Most of those lawsuits are filed by legal news, and they're generally around um, the, 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 the sort of free speech rights of its advertisers. It's a lawsuit right now that's going on in Chicago that's interesting enough around um, 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 blood in the water. And it's interesting because like some prisons have allowed it in and one prison didn't. And the prison made a case against a very specific person getting this book at this one prison. But they are like robust and substantive conversations that we can have about these issues. And I think the way that I hope to move people from from just the like 
Like this book is a substantial conversation about the lives of people in prison. This right. book is like, I'm going to give you this and you could do some material good with your life. That report does not do it for me. Right. And it's so much work that people do that just doesn't do it for me. And it's so much work that I do, frankly, that doesn't do it for me. And the only reason why I represent people in parole is, is not because I was like, yo, this is a, a useful um, thing to do with my time. But it was because my friends were like, yo, you got a law degree. I need you to help me, Shahid. Like, like, that's what I need. I need you to do something. And so and, and I want a different metric, you know, and because I work so hard to get books in the prison and I've gotten my book list approved in all of the places that's doing all of this censorship, then I could say mm. and ask. When you report this, who did you have a conversation with? What conversation did you have? What were you attempting to do? And it just feels can, like, can you know, you a little insight. I mean, so uh, I don't like these people. I guess you should just know that. Right. Like. I literally, it's frustrates the hell out of me because I spend so much of my time trying to accomplish something in prison and I read a report that is so fucking thin and then people quote me and quote my organization and they're like bullshit op-eds. Like, stop talking. Don't talk about me when you talk about that stuff. All right. Just leave me out of it because I'm trying to make shit happen and, and this is not useful and it's not productive. Well, I was I was going to say, maybe you could illuminate a little bit about, you know, what it really means to build relationships like that. And I ask because, you know, I, I don't want to, you know, I, I think we're getting a little into the fray. I think like we can debate the organization's book ban report if you'd like. But I, it is this is the this is talk about our book. So I want to talk about our book. Right. But I also think there's there's a point here that's illuminating for people to listen to, too, because I see that what happens a lot is our volunteer list is is you know, people get mad that I don't have a volunteer job for them offhand, but we have hundreds of people who come to us because there's a lot of interest right now. Abolition became a word that exploded in summer 2020 from the margin to the center on Twitter. And and there's all this <laughs> on, Twitter. <laughs> on Twitter. That's where it exploded. Let's yeah, be yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Off Twitter for a while because I was like, I can't, I love that the, 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 the concepts are being talked about, but the flattening of it was, was driving me crazy. But I, I think it's worthy in the conversation about, you know, who are we talking to on a systems level to explain that, for example, we want to get a set of this book into every prison library we can find. There was no list. San Francisco Public Library and, and, and a fellow of ours, Emma, partnered and did all this research. The, the state versus the federal system versus local jails, everything is running and operating under its own. There's no people don't. Understand? You can't just Google up a list of prisons. And Every you know, San Francisco is interesting because, like, the public library in San Francisco is also responsible for the jail and right. the juvenile detention center. And so it's really interesting because, like, they don't consider their library system. And in a lot of places, the library system is like the jail library system and the public library system. And in San Francisco, um, that's not the case. I don't know if that's true for all of California, but that's why they they would be like great partners because. They're already thinking about these questions. And I, and I agree. I 100 percent agree with that. So I, I think that just, you know, I, I, it, it, it's also an, a, a testament to your work and also just revealing to people who might not know, like the idea of what it means to build relationships with these stakeholders in in spaces of incarceration are not. <laughs> it takes a lot of work and research to even find who it is. And yeah, and, you know, I mean, and it's weird, too. I mean, it's, it's actually like I remember my book got banned in, in Virginia. And and this is why it makes me so angry, though, because I, I know when I've been a victim of it. Right. Like my book got banned in Virginia. And what happens is, is you actually don't want to fight. You want to do something else. Mm. Right. You want to say your book got banned. And then and I had lawyers that's like, yo, Dwayne, we should sue. And I'm like, ah, you know, I don't want to cause no problems. I got this other thing I want to do. I don't want my homie to get sent to the hole. I mean, you know? and and he was like, "Yo, what are you scared of? You are they sending you to the hole?" And and so we sent this like really aggressive letter that's like, "We're gonna see y'all in court." You know what I mean? And they was like, "Wait a minute, wait a minute, what's going on?" And and I, and look, I had a chapter that was called "How to Make a Knife in Prison." So in retrospect, when the CEO flipped through the pages, he was like, "This, this, this sounds like you know," and. But we had a series of conversations and the person right. who was responsible to overturn a decision, it was actually the assistant attorney general in Virginia, you know, they read the book and, and they sent it into the prison. But but what's, what was interesting is the only reason why I got flagged is because I sent 12 copies in. So when it was just one copy, 
They was just like, Psh. but when it was 12, somebody looked at it more closely and that person was like, oh no, these right. dudes are all trying to learn how to make knives. And then the prison was like, this is ridiculous. And I'm not saying that we will win all the time. That's not what I'm suggesting. It's right. going to be censorship. It's going to be challenges. It's going to be fights that you lose. But I, I just think that we, with your book, with this collection, I want to make sure that we're building a different narrative and that the narrative is 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 focused on how can we build bridges? How can we make connections? How can we get 75,000 copies in the hands of people recognizing that it's like 2 million people in prison? So even 75,000 copies is not meeting the actual need. And, and never mind the family and friends who would benefit from being in conversation, you know, yeah. come home from prison, who, you know, who well, want to write their story, you know, all that. And, and so sort of to that point, the book is structured in a very um, particular way. And it's um, there's a, it, it, it addresses a lot of different phases, maybe if you want to call it that, of being a writer. There's sort of the craft things, um, sort of fun, fundamental craft stuff. There's more p things that are more pointed to having a writer's life in prison. Um, there's also sections on community. Can you sort of talk about the, how you decided to sort of structurally sort of form this in that way, this like structure and how it came together. And like, what are some things you knew had to be a part of this book, almost like spiritually, but also literally? Mm. Well, I knew the first, that's beautiful. And thank you for, I was, uh, there's a lot of spirituality in this book. I rec realized and recognized as well. And it's a word we don't use a lot in the nonprofit, you know, activism sphere, but it's true. It's really, I'm like, this book deals in some biblical scales if you really want to talk about life and death. Right. And I think, um, I, I'll tell you the very first essay in this book uh, that I knew had to be included was Zeke Caligari. I went to uh, the Minnesota Prison Writers Workshop, who has a bunch of folks in this book, one of my favorite organizations, uh, brought me out and I and I went into this classroom and it, it was sort of posed to me like Penn would be exciting because the contest and this and that and I had just taken over the program so really any compliment wasn't for me anyway. Uh, so I was very open when I went. And he said, listen, Penn, I want to tell you about the writing collective we started when nobody came in here and it was all run by myself and my friend. And I knew that was, I knew I wanted that essay in the book. I wanted him to write it after he told me the story and he agreed. Yes. Yeah. Well, it comes late in all over this country, especially, like I said, outside of major cities. Right. So that really sparked it. And actually the other essay that I'll give a little sight into what making this book also took. Um, Duane knows the story. I had an amazing essay on zine writing in this book that was one of my favorite essays that I had to take out because the writer pretty brutally sexually harassed me when he came home from prison. And uh, I called Duane for advice. And um, I, I, he just wasn't uh, in a space where he could really represent. I, I was like, people can't write to this guy right now. He's not ready for the responsibility of, of, of the scale of publication. And it broke my heart. But I think, you know, it gives you a sense of the energy of the book. I came up in the DIY punk rock hip hop scenes, and I think that's why I think prison creators are so interesting. But, and you know, but, but you know, was, I mean, what's real about that and, and the conversation and the story that you were talking about, and even like, like me, you know, like, 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 I think it's like, yo, is, is Dwayne going to write this for it? You know what I mean? And, and like working with so many people and having all of these challenges. And and like Curtis Dawkins, who 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 um had the same editor that I have for something that I'm working on, who's like you know a good writer who's serving a life sentence, and and I think was was beautiful about the project. It's it's messy as hell, and 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 it, and it creates these real challenges that if and it's just like writing is is messy. It forces you, like it just forces you to answer real questions, and it's just not as simple as finding a bad guy, and and that's what I appreciate about the work because the work of a writer. It's messier than just finding a bad guy. And and so maybe I, I, I do resent it because you know what? The fucking bad guys, my homies that killed people like those are the bad guys. And so I do resent it so much when like when like the, 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 the impetus seems to be like, who can I identify as the villain? Yeah, because I know that I'm the one that gets identified as the villain that my homie is like, yo, you know, I, 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 I deprived some young black kid of ever having a father. Like he is the villain and we have tried to rewrite the narrative of our lives to be more than just that villain. And so it's like, how do we escape these boxes that keep telling us all right. we need to do is identify some state system as the as the villain, some broke ass CEO who barely got a high school education as the villain because they don't see the value in Toni Morrison. Like, right. I mean, I think that it has to be more sophisticated 
than that. And 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 like, you know, and I wouldn't have said none of this shit I said if I didn't just get a call from somebody in prison that's like, damn, people keep telling me I'm the villain again. And they keep okay. saying you have no hope of getting out of prison. And they and they're trying to cheat to do it. You know, I, I think it's all of it is connected because when we tell these stories, when Curtis is writing, when these guys in here have been inside, these women have been Piper is writing, they're trying to write like life and substance and beauty and hope and to the people that they know who, you know, when you shuffle the deck and you flip out the card and it says a life sentence, you have done something that you are fighting to get mercy for. You've done something that you're fighting to be redeemed for. And, and, and you know, I just think it's, it's hard, man. And I think the book sets people up to do that well, but sets people up to remind them that others are doing it because it's so isolating right. in prison. Right. You know? I think that's a big. That's one of the biggest things. I think Dwayne just answered the question of the spiritual content of the book for me. So thank you, Dwayne. Um, every essay has those scales in it. Yes, Piper's essay is called "Don't Burn the Spot." It's about writing about people that you know. I was like, you wrote a hit TV show. I mean, you wrote a book that a hit TV show was made on. You can talk about this, right? People always want to know how do I do this ethically. There's a lot of humor and levity in the book, and uh, unexpectedly as well, but there's also a lot of depth and a lot of those messy questions and contradictions, and people are grappling all over these pages with how do I deal with myself, essentially, which is what we all are grappling with, but the stakes are pretty high in prison. So I think that, um, I think that I just lost my train of thought. I keep doing that. This conversation. I think, I think you were going to say, I think that people should get three copies of the book. <laughs> You know, they and, one for themselves, one nah, for the screen. You know. I know what you was going to say, like, because, I mean, this is not what you were going to say, but, and they should buy three copies of the book, and I'm going to get into some audience questions in a second, but what Dwayne is talking about is something that's really, really real. And it's like, it's so real shit because I, and I sometimes, I see it in a place that, when I think about writers and literary spaces, especially like in quote unquote literary Twitter, there seems to be this attitude of like, that, that's very, anti-mercy anti it, it's very interested in identifying a villain and then eradicating them and so and, and i've seen Dwayne, i've seen you sort of speak to this sometimes on, in that space and also in essay form where there's like a there's people who sort of under say the word abolition or think about it in this very shallow way but it's so far any of the practices that would be needed to sort of really live that out are are not sort of evident in in their persons, but again, I think that writing is always t trying to us being our highest selves are most of the, are almost like to me every every passive revision is like injecting a little bit more love. That's how I think of revision: a little more love, a little more that real humanity. Um, and so, obviously, our work can or, and should be higher than ourselves, but there is a a big gap. I think there's a big gap in terms of. Uh, sort of knee-jerk fear that causes us to like really, really want to quickly, without nuance, identify a bad guy, and you know, be like, "That's the thing." I'll fix it. We named it. This this book is full of quote unquote. I mean, we're all bad guys, obviously, but this book is full of bad guys, and there's a, a big misconception that people often come, even wanting to work with us, saying. You know, with this idea because of of the narrative around Rockefeller drug laws that everyone in prison is innocent or innocent adjacent or in for nonviolent quote unquote right. crimes. And the the fact and the reality is most of the people that I work most closely with are people with very long sentences because they've developed their skill over time and relationships to the walls and that's that's who's built a body of work. And so I'm I'm you know, Dwayne, we we've talked about this where you're like, Kate, you've sat on parole hearings for people for six hours. You you know, there's a sense of a kind of behind the scenes of and then I'm on the phone with you. We're talking about that. And I'm also saying, well, this guy came home and did this. How do I grapple with this? What do you think? And there's yeah. no neat answer. I can't answer. remember what I said. I actually know what I said. I'm not going to repeat it. Thanks for back, but I'm not going to say it. <laughs> I know what I said. I'm not going to repeat let me, it. <laughs> let, me, let me get to some of these uh, questions. This is from uh, H. Patricia Blackshire. Uh, she, they ask, how does a former inmate tell their story about their prison experience in book form? Uh, what beginning steps are necessary? And I mean, <laughs> I think they tell it the same way a non-former inmate tells it. <laughs> right. I'm sorry, that was really facetious. I, I think one, you get the book. I think that's what you do. This is the and, best, literally. And, literally. Yeah, literally. I think you get the book, and and you start with that. I think that um, and if you know somebody that's in, and, and it'll take them some time to get the book, I think you get the book, and and you type up some chapters. 
and you send them three or four paragraphs at a time as you wait to buy, you buy two copies so that you don't feel bad, you don't feel like you're stealing, and then you send them a letter with it. Because I remember people would send me articles and stuff. But honestly, I think that the answer to that is the book. The easy question is you could get this book. That's why you know, the hardest thing is to write screenplays. <laughs> and the book breaks down how to write screenplays. It is such a hard thing. Um, it's everything is in here. You know? It breaks down, if you're interested in publishing, how to start in that process. I mean, there's no direct straight and narrow path. It's exactly what Dwayne says. That's why people ask those questions all the time to us. And I'm like, well, I'm still trying to figure out these answers for myself as a writer. So how do I bring together the kind of big question marks? And that that's all in here. And the beauty of the book, though, is for real, it's game. But it's, it, it, it's relevant to anybody who writes, truly. It's not like this is just right. a, it, it, it's a it, the reason why I center around prison is because prison is a way to understand the American experience. And I think by centering around incarceration and, and using writers who've been incarcerated, you're also saying something about the democracy of language and that there are skills that have been developed by people inside. But it is people who have been in prison who are like given instructions for this. It's not like... You know, when you ask that question, it's not like we went to answers from a series of writers that we could name who I love, like Carl Phillips or, you know, like Patricia Smith. I'm um, thinking about poets or like Nicholas Davidoff thinking about like like long form writers. I mean, there's a lot of great writers. Um, nah, like you, you know, it's like, nah, but it's like it's gone to people who have experienced it to make an argument about the expertise that they have, which I think is also it's also an argument about mercy. You know, it's also an argument about possibility. And so yeah. I love it. I read it and I learned stuff from it. Like like in a very on a craft way. Like I like think a new another way of thinking about revision, another way of thinking about um really internalizing this sort of I really love what you said about the desire to identify a villain. Cause I often, often, often I really find myself in my work trying to avoid that. And I think this book is one of the that's something a lot of craft books don't have, that sort of oh. heart. I mean, it's a chapter on after grammar. And, and the, thing is, first piece. You know, the thing is, like, the cool shit about it is it's, it's really brass tacks in some real ways. You know, it's yeah. really like, and it says, and it starts with honesty. I started writing this saying, read a jail, the gold publication. It took 12 years. But then, but then um, you get the game on how you could short, shortcut that 12 years. And it might not take you 12 because now you go into it with some, with some skills and some tools. I, yeah, honestly, I think it's a fantastic book. I, I'm really impressed, and I think it was a great idea. And 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 and, and, and you know, the only real response to censorship is to keep publishing, is to keep writing, is to keep making people review books, and then start staking out claim about why why this book matters. Well, I you think Dwayne, that that's a really amazing point too. When we think about there's so much opposition in this landscape, and and I I started to feel really saturated by that and weighted down. I was like. You know, if, if I'm going to be part of the dialogue, the way I want to be in conversation and community with people is to be coming from a creative standpoint. You know, I'm a writer, I'm an artist, like I want to create different things with people rather than just oppose all the time. So I'm glad that comes through in the text. And I, I just wanted to underscore that because I think it's an energy uh, that, you know, really moves and changes culture, you know, right. more than just sort of stands in a stance against and so again, just like for people, like a, a, a genuine answer to the question of trying to write a book. You know, this is a great start. And you know, if you if it's hard getting one, I'm sure contacting someone here, maybe we can like get that to you. Um, another question from Jono. They say, "Would love for y'all to discuss the creation of um, underground language in this space, remembering particularly how enslaved folks have." and do create methods of communication to circumvent surveillance in relation to getting stories and topics into institutions or out of institutions without censorship. Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know. Metaphor. <laughs> you gotta hustle hard, man. I, yo, yeah, I was in prison once. I had a cell partner who used to fix everything, right? Yeah. And um, and the thing is like to fix stuff, if you wanna resort a wire together, the, the connection, the wire has to be clean so that the connection will stay good. So you could melt off old solder and use it. But if you did that, the connection would be dirty. And so then you fix somebody's TV and it breaks down in a week. So it was this, it was this thing called flux that you had to use. And if you had the flux, then it would clean, basically it would clean the wire so that when you made the connection, it would stay. And this guy, he could fix anything in prison. He had like a whole little manila envelope filled with the schematics 
for every TV and every Walkman that had been produced in prison, like for the last six or seven years, right? He had COs bringing him flux. And, And it wasn't narcotics. It was flux because he served a role. And so when we think about underground language, when we think about underground communities, I mean, I, I think the writing serves a role. And, I, and I, I remember being hip to Stephen Barnes by a CO. You know, I remember getting my job in the law library because um, the, the, the God that worked over there, you know, he liked to read books and I used to mess with him about books. So I, I, I think. I love that you're also muddying up the narrative of who's co-creating the underground language because you just yeah. brought COs yeah. all into that. But also talk about kites. Like there, there's a whole, there is, there are systems where people find each other in prison through different means. I don't know if our audience all knows what a kite is, but maybe you can illuminate. It's it's a letter. It's it's a beautiful, actually, a beautiful metaphor for freedom. But a kite is a letter. I mean, I, I talked to you, and I got you know these these pieces on my wall. Wow. Were made by um. You know my th- this camera's messed up, but these pieces were made by um. You know the clothes, the gray pieces are are come from the clothes of friends of mine that that were doing life in prison, you know, and he sent me their sweatpants and their, and their t-shirts. And, um, and I was working with a, 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 a artist and I turned it in a handmade prison paper. And, um, and then, you know, my people got, um, you know, long, so I won't go into the whole thing, but one of my friends came home and died, you know, and all of these guys were sending me their clothes when they had life without parole. And then some of them are out. A lot of people send me their stuff out now. Um, but one of my homies came home and he, and he died. And, and so, we took the big sheets of paper. So this is one of the sheets right here. Mm. We took the sheets that was like 20 by 30 and um, and we chopped them up into small squares that we call kites to think about the kite in prison. And then we were able to embed um, his letters. So like, you know, um, so now like this right here is, is one of his, this damn camera is crazy, but this is one of his letters that we wow. embedded into the kites. And, um, and this one's crazy because the artist who did it is Japanese and she doesn't even speak, she doesn't speak English that well and she didn't read the letter, she just embedded it. But she happened to take to cut up the letter that um that was him telling me um the address to the parole board, asking me to write the parole board before this is a couple years before I went to law school and started representing them. I mean, but the point is, you know, we create underground languages with the materials that we have, and sometimes we invent materials. And I've seen dudes you know, write books, handwritten books, and they just pass them around to people in the prison yard. So, um, but, you know, I think that's a hard question to answer because we do it one step at a time. And it is metaphor, it's invention. Um, and sometimes it's, frankly, sometimes it's honesty. I, I actually want to start this. And it's and it's fighting with people to start this. I mean, it's like just because you're in prison doesn't mean that, you know, universities, people had to fight to get black studies programs. People got to fight to get the syllabus changed. People got to fight to get speakers that they want at universities. I mean, I think that like none of this stuff is, is supposed to be easy unless you were Tyrannosaurus Rex. Then, you know, uh, just so What's really interesting about underground communities that could get created is that uh, when we when I first came to Penn and we were doing events, we were commissioning people to write about the risks they were taking writing in prison. And uh, we shared it, well, obviously each writer that wrote from all these different prisons around the country and their folks saying, I had no idea that other writers and other prisons were right. having, were coming up against what I'm coming up and it's horrifying and it's comforting. And so I think what was really interesting when I when I you know went to go through this entire book is I started to notice that there are names that echo across the pages, people who've mm-hmm. read each other, yeah. people in history, and I was like, whoa, there there is this is a community. It's just dispersed and people don't know they belong to it. And I, you, I, I didn't even know Will I didn't even know Rado. Like, I mean, he was writing when I was in prison and I didn't know he existed. And so right. the other service that a project like this does is make the public aware of this history and lineage of prison writers like Curtis Dawkins. I mean, his book is on my shelf, too. You know, so I think um, I think that's the other thing that it does is it makes people on the inside and the outside aware of this tapestry of voices that's sort of out in the wilderness, but that's pushing against that wilderness, because I think. Every time you write something, you push against the 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 the, the existence of that wilderness. I never want anything from Penn either. I gotta tell you, I think that's part of where my resentment comes from. It's like <laughs> I was struggling every year, man. I couldn't I couldn't even get honorable mention. I was in the contest when I wasn't here. I, I feel so I got honorable mention again. I used to be like, man, just stop it. 
<laughs> when, when Penn asked me to do something, I low-key felt like I owe them at this point. So I'm like, okay, sure. That's not why I'm doing this. That's this I wanted to do. the biggest award there is to win at Penn America ever. So you are on opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, <laughs> another question from, uh, from Mag, which you guys sort of actually were really speaking to just a second ago, but they asked, are there archive projects for writers from prison that you are working with? Yeah, that's, I mean, you know. Doran Larson's project. The American Doran Larson, he, he has an essay in the book, a, a writing prompt. He's a longtime prison educator, and he runs, oh, it's at maybe John Hopkins now, don't quote me, American Prison Writing Archive that scans and, and seeks to create this arsenal of, uh, particularly of nonfiction coming out of prison. But archiving is a, is a huge question for us, I know, because yeah. we have a small staff scanning away people think we're this ma massive organization it was two of us for so long and hand scanning and, and, and you know storage where does it go? i mean it's it's a real and also but also with the other thing is like who who gets to determine what goes into the archive because a lot of times i mean i'm sitting in my juvenilia i hope that pen burnt the poems i sent to him it was a reason why i didn't get honorable I mention you know what i mean boxes Wayne. <laughs> we'll, we'll look class yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure i'm burning it they, and, and so, I mean, but I think it's a real, like, it's so funny. My homeboy, I was doing this clemency packet, and he he and he created, so speaking of archives, he had, this is like the program from the first poetry reading I participated in, you wow. know, and it's 2003. Wow. And it's, it's a black a museum. Put that in a museum. Yeah. But, but what happened was when I was working on this clemency, John was like, yo, what, what did you keep? And he was like, man, I kept everything. And so he has every certificate he did, every program that he created, like, he became his own archivist. So I think one of the things we point to when you say like who controls the archive, a lot of a lot of times we're sending things for publication, and and we have no. I feel like you know I almost feel like you have to announce that that's your intention because a lot of the work is juvenilia, and I think what we need to do is equip people to think about what it means to archive, and if we want to archive people's work, if if Penn had all the resources, I think it would behoove Penn and 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 all of us to like announce to people like. Oh, and 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 chick, click yes, check yes if you want to be a part of the archival. Right, word, 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 word. That's actually not a hard thing to do because we send out surveys and onboarding forms to our programs all the time, and that's something you know we we just haven't had a chance to even really. Good idea. I mean, I know because you said the resources. Yeah, it's, it's a and resource question. Fund, but and who wants to fund it? You know. And, and you know, one of my homies is. Y'all know you're mad at us, and then you love us the next day. Yeah. We're used to it, Dwayne. But but what I love about you guys and Jay's store is that you know they it, they work with people who've been inside, who've come home, and, and they build a bridge for folks in terms of not just employment, but but to make people know that the relationship that they built with them in prison, like doesn't necessarily end when they leave. And it's always wonderful to see somebody who's done time, who's able to come out and get. That because you, you still need the professionalization, you know, it's like you've been at home. I mean, you've been in prison for five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years and you become a writer. It's right. how do you build a community in the world? So I, I, I am really how God said. good question, yeah. um, uh, Mag, like you might have helped start an archive project. Um, here's uh, another one. And I think I can guess some of the answer. The, um, it's Anne, is it Bowie? Um, they said, is there room for other vocations to be involved with prison abolition in a radical way? Maybe one or two more questions after this. So the question is, is there room for other vocations? And I'm sure there is um, to I mean, be involved. We, build, we would work it. I mean, you look at it's a lot of prisons that have like in Maine, they, they got a shop outside of the prison where the people do woodworking are doing it. Um, you know, they doing woodworking in the prison and they're selling the work outside of the prison. I mean, they got coding schools and, and California prisons. It's a whole, all kinds of things that's going on in I different industries. Anything, anything could be yeah, it's anything only, can be this. Yeah. It's only limited by our imagination. Right. You know, I mean, literally, like the coders in, in, in California, they getting paid like $17 an hour sometimes. These fools had a, a, a um, I shouldn't call them fools because they brilliant, but these cats, they had a contract with like, like Facebook or Google or somebody, and they had to build the website for them from inside. But because they didn't have access to the internet, they had to build a mirror site so that they could test out the code that they were doing. I mean, it, they had to, it was like four layers of security and four wow. layers of like bureau, bureaucratic nonsense they had to go through. But they did it, you know, and they got this coding school, and it's amazing. So I think I would I think also it's only say by imagination on a philosophical level, uh, also in thinking about abolition. You know, a major problem for people coming home is the risk of recidivism or falling off the edge or not having the resources to hook into community. So I think 
helping people come home is a huge piece of that conversation that gets under talked about. There's this sort of philosophy and, and, and banner waving, but then folks come, even folks that come home who are incredibly intelligent and sharp struggle on a professional basis. Like you're saying, Dwayne, because people are coming home with PTSD. They haven't been using the internet for ages. They don't know how to write five emails in five minutes span, or they haven't had practice doing it. Uh, it's, it's like coming home to a different world for a lot of people. And they don't, and often you don't know how, like, I mean, I don't know, keep going into personal stories, but like, sometimes you just don't know how to ask for help. And yeah. you could be in a situation where a bad week leads to homelessness. Right. Um, and so I, I think, you know, I mean, it's complicated, it's hard, but, but other vocations being involved creates a real opportunity to have more, you know, more structures that provide kind of safety nets for people. And it might be kind of unsexy, but part of it is getting people mainstreamed into society. So if you're anti the society we live in, fine, but also people need to survive it. So I think there's a way in which uh, the politics and the buzzwords can get in the way of the real humanity and the real work that needs to be done. And so I'm glad a, com a question like that comes up. Yeah. All right. So they're giving me the start to wrap it up. But before we do that, I just wanted to ask one more question. Um, and it, it's just for me, just about, so you guys are obviously involved in advocating for the dignity and rights of the incarcerated. And, uh, you know, I'm sure, I know there's a lot of difficulty and there's also like, you know, pleasure and hope that you have been able to find and cultivate in, in this work. And can you guys just speak about sort of this, generally like that, the work that you guys are doing and how like you sort of keep hope, I guess. And quickly, because they're gonna probably cut us off in like three minutes. I'll keep mine really short. For me, yeah. it's the people I get to be in community with, both on this side and through the walls. And uh, you, you know, I keep hope through my relationships and through being inspired and letting people inspire me. Yep. Yeah, and not, you know, you just got to work. You know, I mean, I, I think sometimes you just got to do it. And 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 I am, and I'm, I'm enorm, I'm enormously, uh, like overwhelmingly. I'm blessed beyond any talent or skill I have. And so I think it's an obligation for me to be hopeful. And I think it's an obligation and a duty for me to to do what I can. Um, so I just say yes to it. I love it. Um, someone asked how that can they serve Freedom Reads? I know there's a website uh, that might be the best way to get tapped in. Yep. Go just check out the website. And um, and and we don't take we don't take donated books because all our books come from the distributor or the publisher. And we make sure they're brand new. Because I love a brand new book. This is a brand new book. And I think people inside should get brand new, beautiful books. And you should get three copies of this one. One for you. <laughs> one for <laughs> and one for somebody else you love that's in prison. And and on that note, thank you guys so much for this incredible event. It's been really beautiful speaking to y'all. And maybe someone from Haymarket will take us um take us out. But I really appreciate this. It's been thank beautiful. You. Truly. Glad to be in this world with you both. Same. Gives